Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming and of course a new Elden Ring Things You Didn't Know episode. Last time I talked about some mechanical tricks and tips that we could use to help players in their various builds and experiences, as well as a few big lore questions. Today I'm happy to say that we had so many comments about these topics and details and I'm looking forward to going through a lot of these over the next few episodes, so a huge thank you for getting involved with that. With that said, let's just get into it with the first one of this video. We begin today's episode then with one from the comments. From Ariosto Silver, which I hope I pronounced right, we're talking about these martyr effigies that you find all around the world. And when you go up to them and activate them, you basically put yourself in the pool of potential summons in this area. And other than that, they're not that exciting or interesting, just other than the interesting symbolism of the quote unquote hanged person that turns out to be the way we find Marek at the end of the game. But there's a tiny little detail in regards to their design that's actually quite interesting that was brought up by Silver and it's to do not necessarily with what you might think is the obvious part but what's below right here. This symbolism is actually kind of clever. The idea is that you're summoning from a pool of other tarnished, other tarnished that are connected to the round table hold. Silver was the one that notices that down here this actually represents the round table. These carefully drawn lines are to connect to the round table. If you imagine the center of the round table with its table in the center and then all of the weapons sticking out of it in that specific way, forming a circle of weapons with very intentional lines, then we look back at the effigy again. Well, this is exactly that. From a bird's eye view, we have the circular table and then the various weapons, spears, halberds, swords, and so on, sticking out from it in much the same way. In fact, this one at the bottom center here is literally a sword with a cross guard. You can see that. This is an incredibly subtle detail, but when you stop and think about it, well, it makes sense. You are summoning other players from the pool of round table hold. So of course the symbolism is perhaps this being the soul or person that you're summoning. And then the sword is connected to the round table hold as the source of the summon. I really, really like this concept and I definitely feel myself uh, subscribing to it. So great theory there, Silver. Moving on though, we have to return here to the boss fight room of Estelle because we want to follow up on that conversation we had about them. We talked about this great image from Slavsky on Twitter, taking a look at the various forms of the Estelle, how it seems like this is an evolution of Estelle. The falling star beast, the adult form, the cocoon hanging form, and then the sort of bloomed, finished form that is Estelle. It was this conversation that brought up some comments about this concept and how there was real world inspirations for this design it would seem. B Platinum Paladin has this great comment about it. This life cycle actually appears to look similar to that of an antlion, which he explains starts its life as larvae with large mandibles, just like the falling star beasts. Interestingly, they'll sit in the bottom of sand pits they create like a trap and then eat things such as ants that fall into it. Much the same as Estelle, the antlions also have another stage in their life where they become a pupa, buried under the sand in a sort of cocoon form. Much like other creatures then that cocoon, like say a butterfly, the antlions have much the same, ending with their adult life known as the antlion lacewings. So these lacewing versions of the antlion, they appear to be quite similar to the design of Estelle. The same sort of almost dragonfly style wings that you see in both. It was Cameron Christian who was talking about how the beast form is kind of like the antlion and the Estelle is more like the antlion lacewing. But looking at those sandpit traps that the antlions create to entrap ants and eat them, well, you know, it kind of looks like this crater or the other craters that they make when they land in the world of the lands between. This crater could be, in a way, inspired by those pits. Of course, it doesn't work quite like that in our experience in Elden Ring, but we do kind of come up here and walk into a trap with the Falling Star Beast in its adult form. As we step into this pit in this crater, we have to have a boss fight with it. This is some of my favorite stuff to learn and look at in this series. Much like when we see, say, armor or weapon real world inspirations for really unique weapons we have in Elden Ring. It's really cool to see, say, the design of unique or interesting creatures like Estelle and its evolution and where that possible inspiration came from in the real world. So a huge thank you to everyone that was commenting about this. At the very bottom, of the tower in Kaelid lies an interesting secret and reveal. The Godslayer's Greatsword, a very important weapon, is located in the chest right behind me, picked up at the bottom of this tower. Its lore, as stated, is that it was the sacred sword of the Gloam Eyed Queen who controlled the Godskin Apostles before her defeat at the hands of Malekith. So, the previous owner of Destined Death, the Gloam Eyed Queen, this was her weapon. 
her sword. The black flames wielded by the apostles are channeled from this sword. It's sort of a source or beacon of that, and it is representing that in its spiral design, sort of like flames. Also, if we take a zoom in here, it's got eyes on it. It's quite a creepy weapon, quite a cool design. I really like it. And it's found in a kind of strange way, you know, at the bottom of this tower in just a normal little chest and a tucked away room that is interesting, but not overly grand or anything like that. Like a deep and dark secret, this makes sense. Now, prior to actually looting that chest, you must first make your way to the bottom of the tower and defeat a boss fight, where yes, we have many people who died to it, and you might think, oh, well, that must mean it's a very powerful, very interesting boss to say that it's the guardian of the Glowmide Queen's last treasure and some really important lore. Well, no, it's just a godskin apostle, one that you fight all over the world. In fact, Godskins, whether it's apostles or nobles, are so reused in the world, but work exactly the same wherever they are. Godskin duo fights exist not once, but twice as well. It's pretty offensive. And it's why there's the whole meme of the Godskin tripler or the quartet coming in the DLC. Why are we talking about this though? Well, it comes from Reman Chen in the comments with a really cool theory about the boss fight that we fight here, this particular Godskin apostle, right before such an important item that you have to really work to get to. Reman suggests that there was actually a different fight planned here at the bottom of the Divine Tower of Caelid. With the Sword of the Queen being here, there surely would be more defenses than just a normal apostle. And while it's true there are more defenses than that, you do have to climb your way into the tower and down the tower and fight through various Black Flame monks as well. It ending in just an apostle is undeniably a little bit disappointing and strange. But the theory gets real credence when Reman references the fact that the music actually doesn't stop after you defeat the Apostle in this boss fight. For some reason, it continues for upwards of 20 seconds or so. Now, that might be just, say, an error, a bug, but it could actually be an indicator that something else was planned here and they just didn't go for it, and so again, they just slapped another god skin in its place. It could be, maybe, that, you know, with the idea of this really important item being behind, they wanted the music to keep playing, to keep the atmosphere, as you come here and you find such an important lore item. But it's quite strange, so let me know what you think about that. Finally, for our next couple, we're going to talk about bows and arrows and interesting details to do with that. It was Jack Niles in the comments who talked about the unique design of arrows. It's quite an interesting thing because as you aim your bow and knock an arrow and shoot it off, it's mostly just an arrow and it depends what effect you've got on it that actually displays. So in this case, we're firing some fire arrows, so you can tell that it's obviously firing a fire arrow as it goes. If I don't aim down sight and we take a look at it, again, it is just an arrow and the end of it just appears to be on fire. What about, say, a unique unique poison arrow that actually has, well, a unique design. If you actually stop and look at it, it's pretty damn cool, actually, the visuals of this. It's something that I've never really stopped to pay attention to when I'm aiming, say, a shot like this. This is a poison arrow, and what we're looking at is essentially the head of a snake that's almost like vomiting and spitting out venom and poison, and then its wormy body is splitting into not one, but two tails. If you take a look at it with its icon, you can get a proper look at this. It looks incredible. An arrow carved to resemble a flying snake, best used in tandem with the serpent bow. These are apparently loyal minions of the formless serpents. Formless serpents were simply assassins that would use poisonous arts to, well, assassinate. You can see in the case of the serpent bow that again, we have the snake head. And you can see in this case, we have two snake heads and their bodies worm their way into what might actually be, again, two tails that connect to the bowstring. But it's very cool to start and actually look at. And there are other arrows of this nature. For example, the Erd tree here, the Erd tree bow. The idea of this is to send out holy arrows. And we can see that with the almost incantation seal behind the arrows here and their similar design to the bow. With the normal golden arrows, they are just these little arrows with that design. But then say you take the great arrows and it's like these massive spears that you could essentially use as weapons. And this is what brings me into the final thing from Jordan Rowe, who talks about some interesting mechanics you can do with the bow to help those that actually use the bow or do bow only playthroughs. Since there are very limited mechanics, I was thinking that it would be really cool if we we're able to use arrows as direct melee weapons. Making me think of Monster Hunter and the bow uses with that, there are a couple melee attacks you can do using the arrows. With big arrows like this, say when you're using a great bow, you could use them for like a spear attack or with the smaller arrow versions, some quick sort of dagger or carrion slicer style swings. That would certainly make bow only playthroughs a lot more 
more interesting to add some more mechanics to that. But Jordan gives us a good tip to do with the Ash of War that we have equipped here, Mighty Shot. It's a bit awkward to use in actual play. Of course, you need to press the Ash of War key to get it going and then activate the shot. But as you can see, when you pull down Mighty Shot costs FP and it kind of just goes, not really giving you a chance to really aim the thing, requiring you to use auto lock at close range. Jordan's tip is to activate Mighty Shot and then quickly zoom in while you pull it back. It will still fire out in a sort of automatic way, but this at least then gives you a chance to actually aim and fire at incredible range that Mighty Shot actually provides, as well as the extra damage using your FP for that use. Getting a headshot and a Mighty Shot at the same time dramatically improves the damage of any arrow fired. And of course, that's going to be easiest on a stationary target. Still, I would love to see a bit more to the mechanics of bows. They have certainly improved over the life cycle of the Dark Souls series, but I hope in maybe the DLC we can see some melee attacks using those arrows at close range. That'd be neat. But there you have it, once again, another episode down as we crawl our way to nearly 50 episodes of this incredibly long-running series. I have to say again, a huge thank you for so many people getting involved in the comments of last episode to really invigorate a lot of the topics that I can talk about and change things up for a few episodes at the very least. Really appreciate that. So as always, if any of you have any tips and tricks or interesting details, be it law, mechanical or otherwise, then drop it in the comments and we might just include it in the series and give you a shout out. So thanks again. I've been Hollow. You've been you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice. To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage. Is. Uh, goodbye.